Okay, we're good. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Magro. I'm going to be discussing with you our recent British Journal of Dermatology paper entitled, The Differing Pathophysiologies That Underlie COVID-19 Associated Perniosis and Thrombotic Rediform Purpura, a case series. So what's already known about um, COVID-19? Obviously a, a lot. Um, the etiologic agent is the Severe Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome Associated Coronavirus 2. And most patients, in fact, have a self-limited illness. But there is a small percentage of patients who will have severe COVID-19 where the hallmark of their illness is one of acute respiratory distress syndrome. As it turns out, there are two very interesting uh, presentations in the skin of COVID-19 that affect distal extremity or acral sites. The so-called COVID-19 perniosis that we see in mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic children and the acral thrombotic retiform purpura that we see in patients with severe COVID-19 who have acute respiratory distress syndrome. So the objective of this study was really to determine the differing pathophysiologies that underlie these two uh, distinct forms of acral COVID-19. So in our study, we had the opportunity of examining paraffin embedded tissue of uh, biopsies procured from three uh, main patient groups. Group A were uh, patients who had COVID-19 perniosis, and one can see these very striking uh, perperic violaceous lesions on the toes. Um, group B was idiopathic perniosis, uh, which has a lot of overlap um, clinically and histologically with COVID-19 perniosis, uh, typically seen in uh, young women who, have who may have concomitant Raynaud's phenomenon, and sometimes there's a, a familial tendency. Group C um, were patients with thrombotic retiform purpura in the setting of severe COVID-19 and these patients were typically on a ventilator in the intensive care unit. So what we did in the um, cases of perniosis, whether it was idiopathic or COVID-19 perniosis, because they had such robust inflammatory cell infiltrates, we examined the cases in great detail immunohistochemically. We also did some complement studies and we assessed for interferon, type one interferon signaling using a very specific immunohistochemical stain called mixovirus resistance um, uh, protein A. In the cases of thrombotic retiform purpura, where there was no inflammation, we um, examined the cases in terms of uh, complement deposition, uh, C3D, C4D, C5B-9, and we also looked at the interferon signal uh, as characterized by the uh, MXA or mixovirus resistance protein A staining pattern. In addition, in the COVID-19 uh, perniosis and uh, thrombotic retiform purpura cases, we did assess them from a viral perspective. We conducted immunohistochemical stains looking for the expression of SARS-CoV-2 envelope, uh, membrane and or spike uh, protein in the tissue samples. We also assessed for evidence of active viral replication using a SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA uh, probe um, via this ACD RNA scope probe technique uh, once again uh, on the unstained paraffin embedded tissue. And so what did we discover? In these uh, cases of COVID-19 perniosis, thrombotic retiform purpura of severe COVID-19, and also idiopathic perniosis. Well, this low power uh, picture really captures the essence of the disparate pathologies of COVID-19 perniosis and thrombotic retiform purpura. On the left is an acral biopsy of COVID-19 perniosis. And one can see this very striking superficial and deep uh, lymphocytic infiltrate that is arranged around blood vessels and also found in close opposition to the ecrine coil. And 
It is in contradistinction to the COVID-19 thrombotic rotiform purpura, which is basically devoid of inflammation. There are no inflammatory cells. And instead, the blood vessels are injured. There's endothelial cell injury and vascular thrombosis uh, affecting the capillaries, the venules, as well as the arterial system. Well, as it turns out, the um, MXA, you know, mixovirus resistance protein signaling, uh, was dramatically different um, between the COVID-19 perniosis and the thrombotic rotiform purpura. In the COVID-19 perniosis, there was a very strong expression of MXA. One can see MXA uh, staining in the epidermis, in endothelium, and in inflammatory cells. And in fact, the pattern was very similar to classic uh, idiopathic perniosis, which is a known type of interferonopathy. And this was in contradistinction to the MXA staining pattern in the thrombotic rediform purpura cases, which was essentially negative. So let's look at the pathology uh, in greater detail in the COVID-19 perniosis. So here we have a collage of uh, images, uh, both H&E as well as various immunohistochemical stains, uh, including our viral studies as well as our RNA studies. And I'm just going to sort of break it down in the next series of um, images. So we know in COVID-19 perniosis, there was a very intense inflammatory cell infiltrate um, around blood vessels uh, composed of lymphocytes and histiocytes. There was a component of interface dermatitis and also the inflammatory cell infiltrate was um, around the equine coil, a, a so-called lymphocytic equine hydrocnidus. Um, the MXA, which is the type of interferon signaling marker, was strongly expressed in the epidermis, in the endothelium, and in inflammatory cells. And not surprisingly, uh, because there wasn't much in the way of a, a thrombotic diathesis in the vessels, the complement stains C3D, C4D, C5B-9 were minimal uh, to absent. Now, when we examined the cases from a viral perspective, we found that the SARS-CoV-2 uh, protein was minimally expressed in these biopsies of COVID-19 perniosis. There could be the rare extravascular histiocyte that could express SARS-CoV-2 uh, protein. There was uh, practically no evidence of SARS-CoV um, RNA indicative of replication in the biopsy. Only the rare uh, extravascular inflammatory cell showed the SARS-CoV-2 RNA uh, expression. We also assessed for interleukin-6. We know that patients with severe COVID-19 um, have hypercytic anemia. The interleukin-6 was minimally expressed and, and once again was largely localized to extravascular um, histiocytic elements. So in this image, we have that robust lymphocytic infiltrate, and here is the MXA staining showing the uh, strong expression in endothelium and in the surrounding inflammatory cells. The lymphocytes were primarily of T-cell lineage, and hence the CD3 preparation was strongly positive. The lymphocytes were a mixture of CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells, but with a clear cut predominance of CD4 T cells. And this uh, is shown very nicely in this collage where we have a lot of CD3 in and around the vessel comprising a mixture of CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells, but with a clear cut predominance of CD4 over CD8. In addition, a significant component of the infiltrate was of monocytic lineage. And so illustrated is a series of stains that indicate a significant accumulation of monocyte-derived dendritic cells, um, likely as a source of the type of interferon. Um, there were many plasmacytoid dendritic cells uh, as revealed by the uh, monocytes that express CD123 and also other uh, types of monocyte-derived dendritic cells were um, identified these uh, cells uh, all express CD14 and the monocyte-derived de dendritic marker called um, CD11C. Um, 
And interestingly, this uh, very intense interferon um, response associated with all these um, T cells and monocytes um, had, did, did not include a significant B cell component. So the um, B cell uh, studies revealed a um, virtually absent um, B cell response. As far as the virus is concerned, um, as I was mentioning, um, the SARS CoV protein envelope membrane um, stains were minimally positive. Uh, really localized to only rare monocytes. The SARS-CoV-2 RNA, which would be indicative of active viral replication, uh, again was minimally positive, only in a few extravascular uh, histiocytoid elements. And the interleukin-6, you know, really marginally positive. The COVID-19 proteosis cases really had a significant morphologic semblance to idiopathic proteosis, which is a classic interferonopathy linked to mutations in uh, Tbrx1 as well as other um, proteins that are important in interferon signaling. And this uh, shows you a case of idiopathic perineo, how it has a morphology that is virtually indistinguishable from COVID-19 proteosis. This superficial and deep uh, lymphocytic infiltrate, uh, a lot of lymphocytes around the equine coil, as one sees over here. And the MXA stain, uh, again, is intensely positive, very strongly expressed in endothelium and in perivascular uh, inflammatory cells. Now, let's look at the COVID-19 associated thrombotic reniform purpura. The hallmark was this thrombotic diathesis unaccompanied by any inflammatory cell infiltrate with or without evidence of endothelial cell injury. It was clearly a complement associated or complement mediated process based on the degree of C3D, C4D, C5B-9 deposition with evidence of mannan binding lectin pathway activation by virtue of the mask 2 stain. The interferon signaling was essentially negative as revealed by the absence of staining for MXA. And here, when we looked for the sars cov protein, um, whether it was the envelope, the membrane, the spike like a protein, it was intensely positive in the microvascular endothelium. However, even though there was a lot of viral protein in the endothelium, there was no viral RNA. And knowing that these patients have high serum levels of IL-6, the question is, you know, where, what is the source of the IL-6? As it turns out, the endothelium was strongly positive for interleukin-6. And so here we have the collage of images that depict thrombotic reniform purpura of severe COVID. We have the posse inflammatory thrombosis, the fact that there is no interferon signaling going on as revealed by the negative MXA staining result. There is prominent localization of the SARS-CoV protein in the endothelium. Illustrated here is the spike glycoprotein. And there is extensive complement deposition. Illustrated in D is C5B-9 within vessels. As well, caspase 3, which is an apoptotic marker, is upregulated, and the interleukin-6 is strongly expressed in the endothelium of these vessels. As I was mentioning, um, an interesting feature that we discovered was this expression of interleukin-6 within the endothelium of the vessels that also showed uh, concomitant protein, SARS-CoV-2 protein, and complement deposition. It has been demonstrated in other studies that interleukin-6 
six expression endothelium can occur through mannan binding lectin pathway activation. So it seems that an integral component of the clinical course, and in turn, the clinical presentation may lie in the type 1 interferon response detected in our samples with the mix of virus resistance protein MXASD. To review then, in the COVID-19 permeosis of the mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic child, we have a lot of interferon signaling with a strong expression of MXA, similar to classic permeosis, which is a form first interferonopathy, in contradistinction to the negative MXA staining results that we see in severe COVID-19 associated with thrombotic reticulum purpura. And again, just to emphasize the, the contrasting pathologies and pathophysiologies, here we have the prominent inflammation of T cells and monocytes reflective of the type 1 interferon uh, response in COVID-19 perniosis, which is obviously very effective in clearing the virus such that you have minimal viral protein, minimal viral replication, and there isn't much in the way of interleukin-6 expression, and in contradistinction in thrombotic reticulum purpura where we don't have any interferon signaling, we have all this protein being deposited in the endothelium, docking to the endothelium in the absence of viral replication associated with complement activation and a strong expression in the endothelium of interleukin-6. So what is the source of this cutaneous docked protein, SARS-CoV-2 protein, in the absence of any viral replication in the skin? It's likely the septal microvasculature of the lung. Um, we've shown that the virus um, actually does extensively replicate within the septal microvasculature. This particular image here is of the terminal lung parenchyma in a patient who succumbed to COVID-19 ARDS, and one can see using the RNA scope that there is an extensive amount of viral RNA indicative of active replication coursing through the septal uh, microvasculature. So in essence, it is the septal microvasculature that is the source of the viral protein. And likely when the virus dies in the lung, the proteins released from the dying virus um, dock to select microvascular beds uh, outside the lung, including the skin. So the disparate skin manifestations between patients with mild and severe disease highlight the differences in type 1 interferon response in COVID-19 disease. And when you think of the multi-organ Kawasaki-like disease of childhood, it probably is pathogenetically very similar to COVID-19 perniosis, really representing an overzealous interferon response, which obviously is very effective in clearing the virus um, to the SARS-CoV-2. And we know that certain disease states like obesity can also suppress the type 1 interferon response and hence potentially explain, at least in part, uh, the association of obesity um, with severe COVID-19. In fact, the link of obesity interference signaling with the severity of COVID-19 really does um, warrant some further discussion. Uh, we know that the production of the adipokine leptin-1 um, reflects body mass index and its production is re regulated by suppressor of cytokine signaling. When SOX-S3 is upregulated in a high leptin state, in addition to leptin, it suppresses the type 1 interferon response. In the case of COVID-19, type 1 interferons are induced by single-stranded RNA of the virus binding to toll-like receptors 7 and 8 in endosomes. The type 1 interferons produced are released and bind to the type of interferon homodimer receptor, which is ubiquitous in the body, 
This leads to signaling through a signal transducer and activator of transcription one and um, two, resulting in the production of a host of productive proteins, including interferon-induced transmembrane protein, which acts as a uh, complement regulator. Presumably, the strong type 1 interferon responses are very important in speeding viral replication. In contrast, the blunted type 1 interferon response allows for massive viral replication and complement activation through the mannan binding lectin pathway. We have shown in uh, prior uh, studies that um, the SARS CoV 2 spike glycoprotein um, by engaging ACE. Two, presumably expressed on microvasculature, will trigger mannan binding lectin pathway activation. We also know that when this pathway is activated through that spike to glycoprotein ACE2 interaction, that it also triggers uh, an elaboration of cytokines from endothelium, including interleukin 6. So, patients with COVID 19 associated perniosis demonstrate an effective immune reaction with T cell and interferon rich microenvironment, likely leading to a mild course of illness. However, this pro inflammatory response could have deleterious effects in a multi organ inflammatory context. Patients with severe COVID 19 disease show virtually absent interferon signaling, implying a permissive microenvironment, allowing for viral replication of the lung and subsequent complement activation in the lung and skin where there is docked microvascular SARS-CoV-2 protein. And so what does this study add? It really emphasizes that the disparate clinical and pathological manifestations of two distinct forms of alcohol disease in the setting of COVID-19 is reflective of differences in interferon signaling. In the mild perniotic presentation, interferon signaling is robust, inflammation is striking, and viral load in tissue samples is expectedly minimal. In contrast, in retiform purpose of severe COVID-19, interferon signaling is absent, cutaneous viral protein localization to endothelium, and complement deposition with vascular thrombosis is impressive. Thank you very much.